It is easy to understand why we believe there is no solid basis to distinguish between a building that has quality and one that doesn't. We think the distinction is subjective, maybe even arbitrary. In The Timeless Way of Building, Christopher Alexander says this idea persists because the single central quality which makes all the difference cannot be categorized or named. This curious notion is also explored by Robert Persig. In his classic Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, Persig discusses this concept of quality at length, and the ideas in this video are largely based on the works of these two thinkers. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel so you can follow my journey as I explore the work of Christopher Alexander and the timeless way of building. While teaching a writing course in a school in Montana, Persig's protagonist Phaedrus becomes obsessed with the question of quality. He spends quite some time trying to come up with a working definition of what quality is and then eventually settles with Quality is a characteristic of thought and statement that is recognized by a non-thinking process. Because definitions are a product of rigid, formal thinking, quality cannot be defined. I know this is essentially a refusal to define, but he's right. Quality is a result of a non-thinking process. It can be thought of as the awareness of reality before conscious thought. There is always a bit of delay between the moment we see an object, like a tree, and when we recognize it as a tree. We don't think this delay is important because this is just how we perceive reality. It is how we live. But if you really think about it, the consequences are a bit unnerving. This delay, this almost imperceptible delay, means that the present moment remains inaccessible to our intellect. Permanently inaccessible. All conscious thought then is merely a memory of the moment that has passed us by, nothing else. And considering that the future exists only in our plans and the past in our memories, that elusive moment is all we really have. And it is this pre-intellectual reality that Phaedrus identified as quality, pure experience. The moment you break the seamless quality into parts with words and definitions, all you have is fragments of misrepresentation, not quality itself. And that is because you cannot divide a whole without destroying it. Alexander demonstrates this idea by discussing a few words that people use interchangeably to describe this quality without a name, and shows how none of them fit the purpose. The word alive often evokes the sort of images that we associate with quality, but it has other uses too, which causes confusion. For example, if we are pressed to explain why we call a fire alive and another dead, we don't really know what to say. We can only use the word to name quality when we already understand what quality is. The word exact lacks a sense of freedom, and the thing which has the quality without a name never fits an image exactly. It always reinvents itself, retaining its essence but shifting in form. He also discusses other words like whole, comfortable and egoless, but you get the gist. We can disagree with Alexander's assessment of these words, but he's making a broader point here. A point about the limits of language and our ability to define reality. You see, words are merely tools we use to represent reality. They aren't reality itself. And certain concepts, a certain elegance in the world reminds us of their limits. No word precisely maps the contours of this reality we are trying to describe. It misses certain edges, edges that in time reveal their importance. And if we cannot describe quality, what can we say about the objects, places and people who have it? In some ways, the goal of this channel is to explore this very question, but the shorter answer is that all things which have quality exist without pretense or internal conflicts. We are often tormented by images of who we need to be and how we need to act, and our lives are dominated by these images. This is true for objects as well. We can all recognize an insecure building trying too hard to stand out, or a group of them competing to outdo each other lost in a permanent confusion. Things that have quality don't behave like that. They exist comfortably with themselves and reach into the realm of eternal. Some do this in time by being so balanced and so self-maintaining that they become almost imperishable. Others meet eternity in their depth, 
reaching the quality for no more than an instant. They do this by existing seamlessly in that instant, without thought or concern with what is beyond itself. It is easier to recognize quality out in the world than it is to understand it in our own head. It is something that isn't mysterious, not at all. It is above all ordinary. What makes it eternal is its ordinariness. Alexander movingly describes a pond he once spent an afternoon staring at. He says, Those ancient fish had been swimming slowly in that pond for 80 years. It was so true to the nature of fish and flowers and the water and the farmers that it had sustained itself for all that time, endlessly repeating, always different. There is no degree of wholeness or reality which can reach beyond that simple pond. Then he concludes, the quality which has no name includes the simpler, sweeter qualities. But it is so ordinary as well that it somehow reminds us of the passing of our life. It is a slightly bitter quality. Thank you.